We can just open in a word of prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, we come before you, Father, and we thank you and we praise you for this time when we can study your word. We pray that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit according to your promise, Father, that you would lead us into all truth as we study, that your will might be done. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's topic, as, as the, uh, the title shows, is the gods of Babylon. And today we're going to have a look at this topic, the gods of Babylon, in two different ways. We're going to have a look at it from prophecy. We're also going to have a look at it from history. And what we want to see as we study is what is the relevance of this topic to do with now, to do with the, in, with the last days. What is the relevance, relevance for us, for God's people in the last days? Because we can see that there's signs everywhere showing us that the end is near. And so we need to have a look at this vitally important subject because it's something that each one of us needs to understand. It's really very important. And we're going to start by looking at Revelation chapter 18 at a message in Revelation chapter 18 and it's represented by an angel. This first slide brings it out. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lighted with his glory. So as we see here it's represented by an angel and it's a message that it says the whole earth was lighted with his glory. So it's, it's very, very important. It goes on. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. This is a very, very important subject that we need to study today. We need to go through this, this text and have a look at a few things. First of all is dealing with Babylon. We need to ask the question, why is Babylon fallen? And what's the relevance for us for today in these last days? And to go through this, we need to have a look at a few scriptures to see what the Bible says about this subject. So we'll have a look at Revelation chapter 13. Because in Revelation chapter 13 it gives us some clues about this subject of Babylon and why it has fallen and why it has become the habitation of devils. So Revelation chapter 13 and we'll have a look at verses 2 and 3 of Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. What we want to have a look at today is who is this beast that's talked about here? Because it says the whole world wandered after the beast. So we, we need to discover today who is this beast. But we also need to discover something else from this text. It says there that the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So not only do we need to find out who this beast is, but we really need to find out who the dragon is first. Because it's the dragon that gives the beast its power, its seat and great authority. So we need to find out who this dragon is. And why does he give him his, his, his seat and his power and great authority? And the reason why we need to understand this is because it's a, an issue that affects the whole world. Because it says there, all the world wandered after the beast. 
So we need to understand this subject because it is vitally important, because it affects each one of us, because it's dealing with the whole world. Revelation 13.4 brings this out, continuing on in that same text. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? What does this text bring out? The important thing that it brings out here is that the issue is over what? It's over worship. This is vitally important because it, it's something that will affect the whole world in a system of worship. And this text talks about it there. That they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast and they worship the beast. So it's dealing with the worship of the dragon and the worship of the beast and it affects the whole world. Let's have a look at the next one. What I want to find out, what I want to have a look at today is how this symbol, which we'll have a look at now, how this symbol relates to what we're studying. What does this symbol have to do with the beast and the dragon and false worship? That's what we need to have a look at this morning. Because it's vitally important because it affects the whole world. So we need to have a look at this because it's dealing with worship and a false system of worship. Let's have a look at that text again because it says there and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast and they worship the beast. So as we see it's a system of worship. But who is this dragon that is brought to view in this text? Revelation 12.9 gives us the answer. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out unto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So what does the Bible say it, this dragon represents? It represents the devil or Satan. The decei and it, it's interesting there, it says that it deceives the whole world. So there's an element of deception in what's going on with this dragon and the beast because it deceives the whole world. So he will use deception to cause the whole world to worship not only himself but to also worship the beast. So that's what we need to be aware of. That's what we need to study today to understand what this deception is that the that the dragon will use to cause the whole world to worship himself and the beast. This is vitally important. But even more serious, if you come to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15, it brings it even closer. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So we can see from this that it's over worship, but this is more than just ordinary worship. This is forced worship. If you don't worship, you face death. So this is a deadly serious issue involving the whole world, and it's over worship. And remember who is worshipped in this? It's the devil, so it's devil worship. It's dealing with devil worship or Satan worship. And we'll see as we go along that there will be laws passed by the governments of this world to, as it's brought to view in this text, to worship the devil or face death or die. But how? How does Satan put this deception forward? to the whole world to worship. That's what we need to uncover today. What is this deception that Satan will use to force the whole world to worship the gods of Babylon? We saw before 
that he will use the beast. It mentions in Revelation chapter 13 verses 2 and 3, it said that he gave his seat and his power and great authority to the beast. But who is this beast that is mentioned? Who is this system that is mentioned in the Bible that the devil uses to force false worship upon the whole world? This subject in the Bible is so important that the Bible uses different terms or different names to identify this power. And what we want to have a look at today is some of those names or some of those symbols and, and um, terms that the Bible uses to describe this power because God does not want his people to be deceived. And so he, the scripture says that before it happens, I will, I will alert you of it. I will tell you about it. And so God has revealed these truths to us through the word. Revelation chapter 17 and verses 1 to 4 gives us one of these terms that the Bible uses. And it says, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore, that sitteth upon many waters. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-coloured beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. This is a really detailed description of a woman. And it gives us a description of this woman who, would call, who the Bible calls a great whore. This is another one of those terms that the Bible uses to describe this system. Now if you go through the Bible, the Bible has two descriptions in it of women. The first one... In, and this is dealing with Bible prophecy. A woman in Bible prophecy is a church. If you go through the Bible and have a look at particularly at verses like 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, it describes the woman as a church. Now a pure woman in, the, in Bible prophecy equals a pure church. And that's what we find from scripture but here this calls this woman what a great whore so this is an, an impure woman and so this would represent in bible prophecy an impure church so we're dealing with an impure church system and notice what it says there it says and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. I want you to notice the colours, very interesting colours, purple and scarlet. And also another identifying mark it has there is a golden cup. These are insights into the identity of this church system, this system that Satan will use to force false worship upon the whole world. And it's a church system that is clothed in purple and scarlet and it centres around a golden cup in her hand. And it's a system that claims worship. What else? What else can we find from the Bible trying to identify this same church system Revelation chapter 17 and verse 18. It says there, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So the, the Bible describes here that this system is a city, that great city that reigneth over the kings of the earth. It then goes on again with another identifying mark in Revelation 18 and verses 2 and 10 where we read before, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It then goes on in verse 10 to give us another identifying mark that 
that links it with something that we've heard before. Alas, alas, that great city, that mighty city, Babylon. So the same power that is mentioned before, dealing with the beast, this same power is identified here as that great city and Babylon. Or the great whore. It's the same power as the great city Babylon that the Bible identifies as the beast. You see, God uses the same, the same power or system, but he identifies it under different terms or symbols or names. And when the Bible repeats something, it's because it's something that is vitally important for us to understand. So it adds emphasis to what we need to have a look at. And here's another one, another identifying mark, something that's very popular today. It's in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Who is Antichrist? If you compare Scripture with Scripture, it's the same power that's brought to view in the other Scriptures that we looked at, which is Babylon and the great hall. It's the same system under different names. This next slide brings it out. Babylon, it's also called the great hall, the first beast. It's also called the little horn and the antichrist power. It's got a question mark there. The great question that we need to ask is who is this power? Who is this corrupt church system that is clothed in purple and scarlet and the, and the worship that centres around a golden cup. There's only one church system that fits this description. There's only one church system and it resides here in the city, in the Vatican City. It's the Church of Rome or the Roman Catholic Church system. Notice here, what did, this, what did the Bible say? That this system was clothed in purple and scarlet. Here we have some images of the purple and scarlet worn by the cardinals and the priests and the popes. And also, what did it mention? What did the scripture mention? The golden cup. There is that golden cup and it says there having a golden cup in a hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. So we see that the Bible has given us vital clues so that we can understand who this system is that we're dealing with, the beast power of Revelation chapter 13 and the great whore and Babylon which is fallen now this is not new information at all. This has been known for over 1,000 years by Bible students and students of Bible prophecy that Babylon and the Antichrist power is the Roman Catholic Church system. But we need to have a look at some evidence from history at this because we don't want to just take you know, someone's word for it. We'll have a look at some evidence from history. This is the Reformation War. And it goes through and explains this identity of the papal of papal Rome with Antichrist was maintained by Luther, Melanchthon, Calvin, and all the con continental reformers. By Latimer, <coughs> Melanchthon, Calvin, and all the British reformers. By the illustrious Sir Isaac Newton, Mead, Winston, Bishop Newton, Loth, Debus, Giraud. Vitringa Bedell and a host of equally pious, illustrious and learned names. The same testimony has been borne in the authorised doctrinal standards of the Episcopal, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist and other churches both of Europe and America. And this same 
text then continues into the next slide. The same doctrine is still taught in the Theological School of Geneva by the illustrious Diorbine and Gaussian. And with, the, with but here and there a solitary exception by all the most learned professors and clergymen of the present day connected with the various evangelical denominations of Protestant Christians. That's from 1852. Notice the date there. So it's not something that is new. This was ancient history and it was standard knowledge for over a thousand years. The interesting thing is that this power will be used by Satan to deceive the whole world. But what's more, we'll go on to read the next one. Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Cranmer in the 17th century, Bunyan, the translators of the King James Bible, and the men who published the Westminster and Baptist Confessions of Faith, Sir Isaac Newton, Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and more recently Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Riley, and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. These men, among countless others, all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist. Notice that that's from 1991. So we see that all of these reformers agreed that the office of the papacy was the Antichrist. In this same system, the Bible calls Babylon. So from this geographically smallest country in the world, Satan will bring his deadliest deception. And it's not just a, a small deception, it's a deadly deception because it, fa it, it, it takes in the whole world. Here we see prophecy fulfilled. When the world leaders kneel in homage to the Pope, do you realise that Bible prophecy was fulfilled in this, in this instance? For the first time in history, three former American presidents attended the funeral of a Pope. Now, Protestant America is the, the most powerful Protestant nation on earth. And here they are bowing in homage to a Pope. And what did the scriptures say? That the dragon gave this system its power and its seat and great authority. And we can see this power exercised here on this earth and more and more as we see history continue. And since that time, this man, Pope Benedict, has called for unity of the whole Christian and the non-Christian world. He's called for unity. And when he came here to Australia in 2008, we see there in this picture he had a meeting with the Prime Minister of Australia. Now the Prime Minister of Australia, he represents what kind of power? It's a political power. It's a civil power. And the Pope, he, rec re he represents what kind of power? It's a religious power. How many other world leaders, particularly religious world leaders, get welcomed by the Prime Minister of Australia? None. He gets special treatment. Even when the Dalai Lama came to Australia recently, he was not met by the Prime Minister. He was met by a representative. So why? Why is this happening? Because the Pope is fulfilling a very special role, empowered by the dragon that is behind him. But remember, I want you to remember something, that when we talk about this Roman Catholic system, that we're not talking about the common people in that system. We're talking about the, the Roman Catholic system itself. And it's the system itself that it will be used by Satan to deceive the whole world, to unite all the people under the power of the beast. And his visit here to Australia was so important 
that for the first time in history, Australia now has an ambassador to the Vatican. That's the first time in history that Australia has had that. So this shows what's happening. And if you go around, to the, to, if you go around all the countries of the world, you will find that one time or another during the last few years, all of the heads of state have met with the papacy. And what does the scripture say? All the world wandered after the beast. We see here this next one. <clears throat> there is another group brought to view in this text in the book of Revelation that don't follow what's going on. They don't bow down and worship the beast or wander after the beast. Let's have a look. Revelation 14 verse 1. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. This is a special group that do not go along with this. It's vitally important. It's very interesting that, that this group is brought to view because we saw that in spiritual Babylon the issue is over worship. So it's very important and it's dealing especially with devil worship because that is the God that they worship in, in, in Babylon and through that system they are worshipping the gods of Babylon. But this 144,000 do not go along with this system of worship because they worship the one true God of the Bible. And it's interesting there, it says that his name is written in their foreheads. What does that mean? What does that mean that his name is written in their foreheads? It's not a literal thing that they would have the, have the Father's name written across their forehead. What is, the, what is in the forehead? It's the, it's the centre of your understanding. It's your brain. So these 144,000 understand who they worship. They're understanding who they worship. And they, un and they worship the one true God of the Bible. And his imprint is in their minds through their understanding and through their assent. They comprehend who they are worshipping, the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. But now let's go back to this other group. Is there anything special about this other group that identifies them? Spiritual Babylon. Because we saw that with God's people, his name is in their foreheads and they worship the true God. But the others, the system of Babylon, what's in there? What is upon, the on, upon her forehead? It says there is a name written. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. That's very interesting. The great whore system has something written on her forehead as well. Very interesting. So both these two groups have something either in or on their forehead that identifies who they worship. With God's people, it's the Father's name because that's the God that they worship and identifies who they worship. With the horse system, she has this name written upon her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great. And this is because this is the God that they worship. But we need to decipher this. We need to understand what this means, Mystery Babylon the Great, as to who is being worshipped with these gods of Babylon that will deceive the whole world. Now we know that it's dealing with Satan worship, but how does he do it? How does Satan deceive the whole world through this system of worship? Let's have a look. What does Rome say that her central God is? 
What is this mystery that is the central doctrine of Rome? Because it mentions that that this great whore has this mystery, Babylon the Great, written on her forehead. The best way to, <coughs> to find out what this is, is to ask the system themselves. And they actually give us the answer. The mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it are based all the other teachings of the Church. So what did the Bible say? It said that the great whore has mystery Babylon the Great written across her forehead which identifies the God that she worships. And here we are told that this mystery is the Trinity. The mystery of the Trinity. And as we saw before, it was the mystery, Babylon the Great. Do you think it's a coincidence that both of these mention the word mystery? No, it's no co coincidence. They are both the same. Rome identifies the God that she worships as a mystery and that mystery is called the Trinity but many will say but all Christians believe in the Trinity what has that got to do with the book of Revelation and what we're studying today this is what we need to uncover the gods of Babylon we need to have a closer look at it and see how this relates to what we're talking about in the book of Revelation we saw from this that Babylon the Great is a mystery, has a mystery written across her head. We see from this slide here how it explains it. Now the word Babylon itself means confusion by mixing, mixing the holy and the profane. From Genesis chapter 10 and verse 10 and 11 and verse 9. Babylon the Great then would equal great confusion. The whore will use holy names. That's mixing the holy and the profane. They will use holy names and ascribe them to her gods. The dragon will be called by the names of the holy God of heaven. And this will cause much confusion. That's very interesting as we go through this. And as we saw before, he will use this system to deceive the whole world. And the way that it deceives is because the counterfeit is very close to the true. It only needs a little bit of difference for it to be deceptive. So the elements are very similar, but one contains error, and that's the deceptive part. But many people are seem to believe that because part of it is true that that means all of it is true and that's not the case that's what we want to examine carefully today because it involves the worship of the people of the whole world but the book of revelation has been given to us and the other scriptures to unmask the lies of satan to unmask who babylon the great really is and to find out what this confusion is and to put it all together. So to go through this next slide, the mystery, Babylon the Great. So it is a mystery of great confusion. But what is that mystery? We've seen that it's the mystery is the Trinity, that which equals tri the Trinity great confusion or the great Trinity confusion. But why is it confusing? Because there's... And there seems to be a lot of confusion as to how you explain the doctrine of the Trinity. Many different people have different ideas and different ways of explaining it. The question is, though, why, why are we studying the Trinity? What does that have to do with studying the book of Revelation? The point is that God has given us vital clues in his word to uncover Satan's deceptions. But to understand this fully, we need to go back in history to literal Babylon. To look at Babylon itself and the system of worship that was in Babylon to understand 
how this relates to God's people today and how Satan will use it. But first, before we get there, we need to understand a principle, and that's the principle of the literal and the spiritual. In the Bible, there are many literal examples, or what we call object lessons, that have a spiritual meaning, as well as the object lesson. And God wants us to understand the literal, so that when we come to the spiritual, we can understand the spiritual. So that's what we're going to have a look at here. We're going to have a look at literal Babylon. And we're going to see how that, how that mixes in with Babylon, which has fallen in the book of Revelation. Because we need to understand what's going on in the book of Revelation because that is actually what affects us today. So it points us back, because it mentions the name Babylon in the book of Revelation, it points us back to literal Babylon. And we find that after the flood, there was a group of people that were led by Nimrod. And they weren't happy in the mountains where they settled after the, after the flood. And so they travelled down to the plain of Jura and they built a city and they started to build a tower in the middle which is called the Tower of Babel, with the idea of making a great name for themselves and building this tower so high that if there was another flood, that they would not be affected by it. And this place was called the Tower of Babel, or as we come to know it as Babylon. And it's interesting that the name Nimrod itself means let us rebel. So Nimrod started this rebellion against the true God of heaven. And he started a system of false worship. While they were building this tower, he started this system of false worship. But God wasn't happy with what was going on with this system of false worship. And so he said, let us go down and confuse their languages. So God went down and he confused the languages so they could no longer communicate with each other they couldn't understand each other anymore. And the tower itself was destroyed. But Nimrod did, was determined to continue this rebellion. And so with his wife, Semiramis, who, ha, who herself has many different names in different cultures, they started this history of this false worship. And this next slide actually brings this, this out. The Tower of Babel was actually the worship of Satan in the form of fire, the sun and the serpent. However, Satan worship could not be done openly because of the many who still believed in the true God of Noah. So, this is this word again, a mystery religion began at Babel where Satan could be worshipped in secret. That's from the two Babylons. It's interesting there, how many forms did this worship take? It was three forms. The fire, the sun and the serpent. And notice that it said that it was a mystery religion. So that Satan could be worshipped in secret. And that that worship would only be known to the initiated and so it was, it was kept quiet, it was kept secret. Because, as it says there, there were too many other people that still believed in the God of Noah. And it's exactly the same today. Satan will use deception and mysteries and have a mystery religion that will deceive the people into thinking that they are worshipping the true God when they are really worshipping Satan himself. And Nimrod established this system of Satan worship and he called it a mystery religion. But the interesting thing is that Nimrod died. But his wife, Semiramis, she continued on with this rebellion. And, she, and so she said that when Nimrod died, that he went up to the sun and he became 
the sun. So Nimrod then became the symbol of, sun, of the sun, or the sun became a symbol for Nimrod and this false system of worship. Now the next interesting thing that happened was that Semiramis, his wife, became pregnant. And so that she could explain how she became pregnant when her husband had died, she actually said that a ray of the sun came into her and she became pregnant from this ray of the sun. And that it was Nimrod actually coming back or being reincarnated, a reincarnation of the sun god. And so when the child was born, his name, the name given to him was Tammuz. And he's also mentioned in the Bible. So under Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz, this false worship of the personification of the sun god, this mystery religion, which was actually Satan worship, was started. And this is just history. This was the first three, the first three that were worshipped. We'll read about this in this next slide. The Trinity got its start in ancient Babylon with Nimrod, Tammuz and Semiramis. Semiramis demanded worship for both her husband and her son as well as herself. She claimed that her son was both the father and the son. Yes, he was God the father and God the son, the first divine incomprehensible trinity. Now this is just history. But it's interesting that it shows here that the Trinity doctrine got its origins back in Babylon when God interrupted the work this system was dispersed God dispersed the system all around the world by changing their languages because God saw that if this system was allowed to continue that it would form a one world government ruled from the Tower of Babel and God, God saw that it, if this was allowed to happen that it would totally obliterate his truth the truth that he was the one true God so he interfered for us in history and the reason we have any truth left today is because God interfered for our sakes and dispersed the people and changed their language but the interesting that happened thing that happened was that when this system was dispersed this Satan worship or sun worship that began back in Babylon with Nimrod, Semiramis and Tammuz as the first trinity was carried in the different cultures and the different languages all around the then known world. As these different cultures travelled they took these same concepts from Babylon to wherever they would travel to and reside into their different cultures. But it's interesting because they had different names and different languages, these three, this worship of three, took on different names because of the different languages. We find this in this next one here. Satan worship or sun worship. We see here that we have, first of all, the Babylonian trinity, which we saw was Nam Nimrod, Tammuz and Semiramis. When it travelled to the different cultures, we see in Egypt, we have Osiris, Horus and Isis. And in tr the trinity of Greece, we have Zeus, Apollo and Athena. In India, we have Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. And in pagan Rome, we had Jupiter, Mars and Venus and so on. In fact, all of the ancient pagan religions had this worship of three and it all started in Babylon. But when the different languages travelled, they took on different names. <coughs> but it was the same trinity of gods and history confirms this. We'll have a look at this here. Three became the most universal number of deity. Sun worship is one of the most primitive forms of religion. An early man sometimes distinguished between the rising midday and setting sun, 
The Egyptians, for example, divided the sun god into three deities. Horus, the rising sun, Ra or Re, the midday sun, Osiris, the old and setting sun. Here we see this same system carried on that started in Babylon. And it's interesting that they incorporated into their artwork, if you notice there on the, sorry, on the heads of, the, of, of these different things, these circle, circular symbols. These are not just a pretty design. These are representations of the sun and of the worship of the sun god. And it's a fitting description or fitting symbol for the God that they worship, the three in one God. This next slide shows that. One sun but three different or three manifestations or deities. The pagans believed in three phases of the sun as the three manifestations of the supreme deity as evident in the Egyptian sun gods which we have a look at before. So we see that this system was continued on, the three phases of the sun. All three equals one sun, or three distinct phases, which equal the three in one God. And they notice that to represent the sun God properly, if they combined the three together, that it would lead into just the one symbol. Very, very interesting. And it was a fitting symbol for the God that they worship because it was the, the three phases of the sun into one symbol, the symbol of the sun God. But who was really being worshipped behind this system? It was Satan himself. And what a deception. And what a fitting symbol to disguise their true religion. The three interlocking, sim three interlocking circles. We see this here. It's easily represented by the three symbols, phases of the sun coming together. Notice that they form a, an interesting triangle. It's very, very interesting. And it's an equilateral triangle. And if you did geometry at school, you'll remember that each angle in an equilateral triangle was 60 degrees. So each angle equaled 60 degrees and they found that if you put these together each angle represented a 6. So this gives us something interesting, very, very interesting. Gives us the number 666 which is the symbol that Satan uses to hide his false system of worship or sun worship. It's the worship of the 666, or the religion of the 666. And it's really interesting, is that this number is also mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. And it's the number of a system. And what we're finding out here are the roots of this system. And archaeology, actually, if you have a look in archaeology, they've come up with, this, with these symbols in archaeology. And they've uncovered the number, the worship of, the, of, this, of this number system, 666, in the ancient Babylonian diggings. We'll have a look here at a, at a very interesting slide. We've looked at history, now we're going to have a look at present day. This is from our Sunday visitor. And it says here, the official title of the papacy is Vicarius Filii Dei or the Vicar of the Son of God. This is very interesting. So the official, this is the official title of the papacy in Latin. There's something very interesting about Latin is that each letter in Latin has a number. And each number represent, is, goes with each letter. So we'll have a look at this because it shows us here the papacy's title broken down into its individual numbers. And here we see from this, here we see that when we add up the numbers of this system, 
Our total is 666. Very, very interesting. When we add them together, it works out to be exactly 666. And we found before that when we looked at Babylon in the book of Revelation and the beast, we found that these are linked together. We notice that this system comes directly from Babylon. That's why, Babel, that's why the book of Revelation uses this term, Babylon, in regard to this system of 666. Interesting here that this 666 is incorporated into the very name that the papacy uses for itself, the official title. What's interesting is that these things are hidden. And they're beneath the surface. But God has shown them to us through the Bible. And God wants us to look at these things really carefully, to unravel and to, and to reveal these hidden things. And to understand who is behind this system of the 666 and that it is really sun worship and, that it, and where it comes from and who is behind it. And that they use these symbols to hide their true religion that is only known to the initiates. They found that through using these symbols, the symbols of the sun, and putting them together, and they didn't have to use the whole three parts of the circle. They could use just parts of each circle and interlock them together to form this symbol, this very interesting symbol, the th these three interlocking circles. And each one of them represented a phase of the sun or the sun god. And this symbol is called the triketra with three interlocking sections. And it was very fitting that when you put them together, you don't need to use the whole, that each part of a, of a circle represented the whole circle and it could be used instead of the whole. So it made it more interesting and more complex and it represented the sun god or Satan worship. And it's, what's interesting is that this symbol can be found throughout many different cultures and pagan systems of belief. But not just then. It's not just, it wasn't just used then. Now it is still used. Symbol, Satan still uses this symbol today in many different ways. We'll have a look at this next slide. You can see that it can be represented in many different ways but it's the same symbol and you can find these symbols in many different temples and shrines and wall paintings and etchings and carvings throughout different pagan religions we'll find this is very interesting here this next one it says the tri triketra is a satanic symbol that has its origins in the occult it has always been associated with pagan beliefs, satanic practices and witchcraft. The Triketra is composed of three sixes overlaid. This logo is the ancient symbol for the pagan trinity. The symbol was popularised again by Satanist Alastair Crowley for the Royal Arch Lucifer of the third degree of the York Order of Masonry. So we find there, it's very interesting as you have a look at that, that there's three interlocking sixes, or the 666, that make up this symbol. The thing, interesting thing is that nobody, who, people who don't look into this, don't realise what is behind that symbol, and that these, this secret mystery religion is using this symbol, but it's own, known only to the initiatives, to initiates. And it's interesting that it's still used today. Here's another example of it. These are goblets, full-size Wiccan goblets. Now Wiccan is used by witchcraft. And these are full-size chalices. And what's that on the front? What's that symbol? It's that same symbol, the symbol of the Triketra, the symbol of the sun god, the symbol of Satan or 666 worship. Why is it there on the front of those goblets? That's because witches communicate with satanic forces. This is in modern day. This is not ancient history. This is 
you can find these things on the website that sells witch, witchcraft regalia and things like that. We found that off a website. It's not only used on, on things like, like chalices, it can also, it's also been used on their, on their gowns and things like that. This is from her Harper's Encyclopedia of Mystical and Paranormal Experience. Symbols are important to all esoteric teachings for they contain, contain secret wisdom accessible only to the initiated. Notice that symbol on the front of that gown. What I also want you to have a look at is the figures that are underneath that symbol. What are they doing? They look like spirits and they're actually lifting up the triketra or actually worshipping the triketra. Now that is devil worship or Satan worship. Many would look at that and think that's a really nice design not realising that it's the symbol that's containing secret wisdom, as it says there. Secret meanings only accessible to the initiated. And today we're uncovering the secret wisdom, the so-called secret wisdom that is behind that. But it's not only the symbol that's a problem, it's what the symbol stands for. And what we found is that the symbol stands for Satan worship. Now, I've got something very interesting in my pocket here that I've just found recently. It's this little white disc here. Many of you might not be able to see it, see what it is, but it's actually a little disc that you put a, an incense stick on to burn it. Now, what it, what's incense used for? If you have a look in the Bible, the incense that was in the sanctuary represented the prayers of the saints. Very, very interesting, ascending to heaven. You can't actually see what's on this because it's a little bit far away. But I, I'll show you shortly, but I found this in my house. I didn't even know it was there. Somebody had given us a present and it was a box, a wooden box. And inside it was lots of incense sticks and this little thing. And I'd never seen it. I didn't even look in the box. I wasn't interested in that sort of thing, but somebody took it out of the box and put an incense stick on it and it was burning it. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, I've never seen that before. I went over and had a look at it and nearly fell over. This is what's on that, on that little thing. In the middle of it, there's four triketras. When you're burning incense, according to what we've just learned, who are you burning incense to? Satan. Satan indicated by those triketras in the middle of it. I'm going to throw this away. Very, very interesting. I was quite, quite surprised and shocked when I saw that. So when you're burning incense in there, you're burning incense to Satan. Very, very interesting. But it's not only used in things like this. It's also used on the television. TV shows like the, the TV show Charmed. It's interesting that that is... It's a TV show about three witches. Not one, not four, but three. Three witches. What's that symbol on the front there? It's the symbol of the Triketra, the symbol of the sun god, the three-in-one god. Is that a coincidence that that is there? No. The world is being trained to accept something and we need to be really selective about what we watch on TV and what we expose ourselves to. It continues on. Here we have a couple of books. The first one is the Aquarian Conspiracy, a book about the New Age. There we see again those three interlocking sixes. That's dealing with the New Age. This next one, the craft. There we see again. <coughs> it's called the craft, a witch's book of shadows. And there again is the symbol of the Triketra on the front which is the symbol of the sun god, the three-in-one god, or Satan. And all of these things came from Babylon. We see here some, uh, an archaeological digging has found this, this tablet. You notice there that it's got the triangle on there. And also above the triangle, 
as some sun disks. And remember that pagans used these symbols, the symbol of the sun god, to represent what they were worshipping. They were worshipping the sun god, the three-in-one god, which is the 666 religion. And the differing cultures that came from Babylon took it with them wherever they went. So here we see a few different slides that bring this out. This is from India. How many faces on that god? Three gods, three faces on Buddha. Why always three? Is that just a coincidence? The common denominator is that they all got it from Babylon. They carried it in their cultures. They remodeled it and renamed it according to their different languages, but it's the same system. Here again, another one from India. Three different gods that are, that are worshipped. And they worshipped, there's one there that has three faces, but there's three separate gods there as well. Here's another one. Three gods down the bottom, overshadowed by one at the top. Why always three? Not two or four, but three. And this is Hinduism, and it's, sorry, it's not hidden. That's, that's what they worship. Notice, I want you to notice something that's around their heads. What is that? That golden disc that's around their heads. This yellow, yellow golden halo. It mean, doesn't that mean that they're holy? Isn't that what it means? That's what we've come to believe. No, it's the symbol of the sun god that's behind their heads. And it's interesting that the system of Rome has adopted these same symbols and the same sort of pictures, the same circle halo around their heads. In this one here, that circle that's above their heads is a symbol of, this, of the sun god. And these are not biblical. They came from, they come to us from Egypt. Here we have those three Egyptian ones. So they come to us from Babylon. Over their heads, the same symbols of the sun god. Now, there's a very interesting text in the Bible that deals with this and, and what God thinks about this history. In Numbers chapter 33 and verse 52, Then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite pluck down all their high places. Why would God particularly say that they need to destroy their pictures? Why? Because as we're finding here, the pictures themselves represented the gods that they worshipped. And so God said, you must destroy them all. He wanted to destroy all of their pictures. But it's interesting that this triketra is not only pictured in witchcraft and TV series, series and pagan religions. Here we find that same symbol on the front cover of the New King James Bible. And we're not condemning the Bible here, but that's a place where this symbol should never be. Because as we found, it's the symbol of what? Of Satan worship, of devil worship. And here it is on the front cover of the Bible, a place where it shouldn't be. And if you look in the front of the King James Bible, in some of the pages in there, it explains what it is. It says, this symbol is called the Triketra and is the ancient symbol of the Trinity. So they admit that it's the symbol of the Trinity and it's called the Triketra. And as we found from history, where that Triketra comes from, God hates things like this, particularly on the front cover of the Bible. Because this is the symbol of Satan and of sun worship, and it should not be on the front cover of the Bible. But it goes even further. It's not just on the Bible, it's actually in the churches themselves. If you have a look here in this cathedral window, there, hidden in the stained glass, is the symbol of the Tychetra. And on the one that's beside it, you'll notice there that it has the three interlocking circles. 
Now I wonder how many people who go into those churches realise what this symbol means. How many people would understand that it's the symbol of the sun god right in their church. The problem is that people are ignorant as to where this symbol comes from and its origins. And we're finding out, out these origins today. And remember, we're not condemning the people that go to these churches because they have no idea of the deception that is being, that is being forced upon them. Here's another one. This is from the Holy Trinity Church in Suva, in Fiji. Notice what is in the middle of there. It's an equilateral triangle. And as we found, that comes back from the archaeological diggings as a symbol from, ba for ba from Babylon, which is a symbol of the sun god. And now it's used in the churches. And when you look at the other windows in that slide, you'll see that they have there the three interlocking circles. The thing is, most people don't realise what this means. They just think it's a nice design. They do not realise that it has secret meaning and that it's a symbol of the Trinity and that it's leading them to worship the God that is behind that symbol, which is the worship of Satan. But it's not confined just to one church. All denominations of the Christian church have this symbol infiltrated into them. But the people themselves don't understand the origins of this symbol and we need to show them. They don't understand how Satan is using this symbol secretly to bring it into the Christian churches totally unnoticed to those that are there. The next one is a Presbyterian church. It's not displayed on the walls or anywhere else but on the pews themselves, the three interlocking circles. When you look at the pews, you'll see that. And the people that worship in that church, they go in there and they don't realise. When they sit down, they don't realise. And they go in there to worship Jesus, not realising that that symbol is right there, a representation of the sun god. They don't understand what's going on. Here's another one. The Roman Catholic Church, there's again is the, are those three interlocking circles in this cathedral, the symbol of the Triketra. The next one was even more interesting. I had a chance to go into this church because I was in a choir and we were singing the Messiah and we needed somewhere to practice. So we went into the, we were offered this church and I walked into the church and there right up the front is a symbol of the Triketra. Once again, we see that this system, Satan is using it and leading the whole world into worship himself. The Bible says that it's the worship of the dragon. And we can see through this system, this is how he's doing it, through these symbols, because it has secret meaning and nobody knows. And through these symbols, he is bringing in this, worship, this secret worship of the sun god. Now notice here, this next slide. This is the Athanasian Creed from the Catholic Catechism, from the New Catholic Catechism. And notice the deception, and many people don't bring it up. Now this is the Catholic faith. We worship one God in the Trinity, and the Trinity in unity, without either confusing the persons or dividing the substance. For the person of the Father is one, the Son's is another, the Holy Spirit's is another. But the Godhead of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit is one and their glory equal and their majesty co-eternal. Very interesting. So this is the God that is worshipped in the Roman Catholic system. They are worshipping the God that we've been showing here, the three in one God or the one in three. But usually when Christians hear this they say, but isn't this what the Bible teaches? The Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what we worship. But remember that the devil who is behind this system is using deception in the last days. And it's deceptive because it's so close to the truth. But with just a little bit of error. 
But if you go through the Bible, you'll find that this system of worship is not in, found in God's Word. That it came into the Christian churches all the way from Babylon. The same concept from Babylon, the three in one or the one in three, but now it has biblical names. It's exactly the same idea, but it's taken on biblical names. With a very, very, and it, that makes it very, very deceptive. This next one is a Christian book, and it's called The Trinity, and it says, Rediscovering the Central Christian Mystery. There's that word again. Mystery. They call it a mystery. And you know what they really mean when they talk about the mystery. But notice that picture there. It's blown up in the next part. It shows three persons there. And they've got that same golden halo around the back of their heads. And as we found, what is that? It's a system of sun worship. It's exactly the same way that the Hindus paint their gods, as we seen in, see in this slide here. The same halo. But now it is taken on holy and biblical names. And people accept it and they don't really know what's going on. And this is why it's important for us to understand what's happening. And that Satan is using this false system of worship to deceive the whole world. Here we have another book. It's called The Trinity. Notice what the symbol is on the front there. It's the symbol of the Triketra. What's really interesting is around that symbol is what? Flames, from the, flames of the sun. It shows really clearly. So this is very, very, very serious. And this isn't an old book. This has been published just recently. And we see on the cover the symbol of the Trinity. And a picture, you know, we know a picture um, speaks a thousand words. And here we found the, the origins of this symbol from history. And notice the conclusions. This is very interesting. Notice some of the conclusions that this book, this, that this book brings in. It says, The oneness in nature and character of the three persons of the Godhead raises a very useful question of prayer, praise and worship. Now, as we know, the, the issue in the last days is what? Over worship. So this book is now going to address the issue of worship, dealing with with the symbol that's on the front cover, the Trinity, and how it works. So this quote continues on. But what about direct prayer to the Holy Spirit? While we have no clear example or of a direct command to pray to the Spirit in Scripture, doing so does have, in principle, some implicit biblical support. It only seems logical that God's people can pray directly to and worship the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but this, I don't know whether you've noticed it, but this is a prime example of self-contradiction. It says, what about prayer to the Holy Spirit? We can't find it in the Bible. It says there's nothing in the Bible that tells us to do it, but we believe it's scriptural. We believe it's biblical. Does that make sense? If you can't find it in the Bible, then it's not biblical. That's very simple. But it says there, there's nowhere in the Bible where it tells us to do it, but we think it's biblical. It doesn't fit. You can't have it both ways. It's either in the Bible or it's not. If it's not in the Bible, don't go there. You can't go there. You can't trust it. So it's vitally important for each one of us to study for ourselves. What does the Bible really say? about who we should worship. Because as we found, the issue in the last days is over worship. And we really need to understand who we worship so that we will not be deceived. Because the Bible never, as admitted here, as it admitted in this, this quote, the Bible never ever tells us to worship the Holy Spirit. And it never ever tells us to worship three. Never. You'll never find that in the scripture. The Bible, the Bible says that we should worship 
one true God through his only begotten son Jesus Christ only those two as Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh to the Father but by me so we honour the Son in the same way that we honour the Father and no one else. But Satan has successfully introduced the three in one or the one in three into all the religions of the world, especially Christian religions. And then to step out of the bounds of Scripture and use non-biblical propositions and say, well, they, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us that we can do it but we believe it's biblical and worship the Spirit, it's not biblical. And they admit here that it's not biblical because it comes all the way from Babylon and it shows the consequences of taking beliefs that are not supported from the Bible. It's very, very dangerous. So this is vitally important. God's people need to understand who they worship, even if... You are going to a Bible-believing church. You need to be careful and follow what the Bible says because the deception is very close to the true. And here we see how this is represented. How is the Trinity portrayed in the Bible? The one true God consists of three fully divine persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is what it says. So the symbol that it uses there is supposed to represent the God that they worshipped. But we found that it came all the way from, from Babylon. The same concepts, but using different names. But it's exactly the same thing, the three in one or the one in three God. Now adopting biblical names, and they admit that it's not biblical. That's a quite, quite a startling statement, isn't it? To admit that something isn't biblical. We need to think really seriously about what you believe. That's why Revelation 13, 16 gives us this warning. And he calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This is a sign, this mark is a sign of allegiance to the God that is worshipped. So we see here that the two issues are connected. Who you worship and the mark of the beast are closely connected. The mark identifies your allegiance to who you worship. A lot of people are asking today, what is the mark of the beast? And that's, that's a really fair question. But it's not hard to understand once you've seen some of the evidence. The mark of the beast deals directly with the God that is worshipped. The system of pagan sun worship, when they worshipped the sun god, they had a special day on which they worshipped the sun god. And that special day is called... So it says there, what was the special day of the sun says his Sunday was already a day exalted among the heathen, being a day on which they worshipped the sun. So that was the day that they worshipped the sun God on, the Sunday or the day of the sun. And we've looked at the origins of this and where did it start? It came all the way from, ba from Babylon through sun worship or Satan worship. And here we find also the origins of Sunday worship is that it came from the same place that the sun god came from. But now it's taken on biblical names and it's done that to deceive the whole world. And they say that it comes from the Bible, but we, when we've had a look at the origins of it, we find that it comes to us from paganism, from heathenism. To worship the sun god is to show your allegiance to the God that you worship or your loyalty to the sun God. And the Roman Catholic system or the beast of Revelation 13 tells us specifically 
what that mark is. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change Saturday Sabbath to Sunday was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. That's a very startling admission. But there's another one that continues on. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So what is their mark of their, of their authority? The change of the Sabbath, the true Bible Sabbath, to Sunday worship. Because Sunday is dedicated to the God that they worship. And the God that they worship is called the mystery or the trinity. And we've seen that these symbols and this mystery trinity religion came to us directly from Babylon. And the Bible calls, calls it Babylon and shows us that it's really worshipping the dragon and not the one true God. And this tells us why Sunday is so important. Catholic reasons for keeping Sunday because it is a day dedicated by the Apostles to the honour of the Most Holy Trinity. There we see the link and we see the connection between sun worship and Sunday worship and the worship of the Sun God and the worship of the Trinity. We saw in that picture, in that, that picture on the front of that book, the picture of the Sun God or the Trinity that is worshipped. And here we see the connection. And many think in the last days that the worship, that the, the issue is just over which day that you worship. But it goes further than that. It goes down to which God you worship. That is the most Im important thing to understand. Is that the day, the which God you worship and which day you worship on, these are the important things. It's either the worship of the sun god or Satan or the worship of the true God of the Bible. And here is another interesting statement. Is not every Christian abides, obl obliged to sanctify Sunday and to abstain on that day from unnecessary servile work? Is not the observance of this law among the most prominent of our sacred duties? But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorising the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. And that's from the faith of our fathers, which is Cardinal Gibbons. That's a really interesting admission, isn't it? Notice that it says... They admit there that it's not biblical, that you will search the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will never find a line, of, a line in there sanctifying Sunday. And also notice it says that Saturday is a day that we never sanctify. Why is it that they never sanctify this day? It's because they are not worshipping the God of the Sabbath. They are not worshipping the true God of the Bible, but they are worshipping another God, the Sun God. And the Sun God has his own day to worship him on, and that day is the Sunday. So you see here, the issue is over much, is much more than which day you worship, but which God you worship on. Because the day you worship on signifies the God that you worship. Daniel 7.25 brings out this change. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change times and laws. So this is talking about the little horn power. This system has thought to change the law of God when it comes to the true worship of the true God. And now this next one shows here the dogma of the Trinity. The Trinity is... The central doctrine of the Christian religion. That's really interesting. Rome claims that the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Christian religion. Before they said that it was their central teaching. Now they're telling us that it's the central doctrine of the Christian religion. So it takes in not only the central doctrine 
of the Catholic Church, but it's now become the central doctrine of the Christian religion as well. Very, very interesting. And we saw before that the Pope is uniting everybody in the Christian and non-Christian worlds under this system of worship. And we found that the system is really going to Satan himself. And that this system is involving a day that is dedicated to the sun god. Notice, for example, this organisation, the World Council of Churches. If you wanted to become a member of the World Council of Churches, you would have to meet certain, certain requirements. This next slide brings it out. According to the World Council of Churches Constitution, agreement with the basis upon which the Council is founded is a precondition for membership. A later study by the Central Committee concluded that there was no need to change the basis, though it was necessary to explain its meaning and also make it clear that the Trinity was implicit in it. So the Trinity is implicit in the, in the constitution of the World Council of Churches. So if you are a church and you want to join the World Council of Churches, and that's talking about Christian churches, you must believe in the Trinity because they are uniting to worship this same God, the God that's brought to, to view in the Bible, which is called Babylon. And if you wanted to join this church and didn't believe in the Trinity, you would not be allowed to join. And that's why we've been looking at the history of this. And since that time, this man has been travelling the world, promoting the God that they worship through the sign of their worship, by promoting the day on which they worship, the Sunday Notice what it says there. It says, without Sunday, we cannot live. And this is an old, as we can see from the date there. This is May 25, 2005. 29, 2005. So now we are told in the last days that there will be a law made <clears throat> that will enforce worship. And the law will be made that will relate to which day you worship. And it will force the mark of the beast whether you are loyal to the mark of the beast and worship on the Sunday or you worship the one true God. And the claim of loyalty or allegiance to this sun God is through the day that they worship on. Notice this next one. The Pope said, Sunday worship is a necessity for all. This is from 2007. And there is another one. The EU must keep Sunday, says the Catholic Church. And this is from 2008. So these weren't that long ago. And we see this man is on a mission to unite the whole world to worship the sun god on his day, the Sunday. And this is why it's important for each one of us to understand who we worship. This is why God, in loving mercy, <coughs> in the last call to the world he warns us here he says this is from Revelation 14 verse 7 saying with a loud voice fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and what worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters so we see here that the issue is over worship and God is calling all of his people everywhere to worship him. And on the other side, the beast and the dragon are calling the whole world to worship them. So we can see the division there. We can see the, the controversy. So the issue is over worship. Who will you worship? God's seal is the direct opposite of the mark of the beast. And just as the mark of the beast is a sign of loyalty or allegiance to the God that is worshipped, so the seal of God is a sign 
of your allegiance to the, to the true God, to the one true God of the Bible. Now any seal, we'll notice from this next, tap, next slide, any seal contains three elements. It contains the name, the title and the territory of the holder. And if we look through history, and sorry, through the scriptures, we find that in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11 is the only place in scripture where we find these three elements. And it says, Therefore in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Here we find these three elements brought to view. The name, the Lord Jehovah, the title, maker, or the creator of heavens and the earth, and the territory, the heaven, earth, and the sea, and all that in them is. So here we see the seal of God. So you see the keeping of the seventh day Sabbath is a sign of our loyalty and allegiance to the true God, God the Creator. And it's contained in His seal, and it's the, contained in the fourth commandment. And we can see that from what we've seen in this slide. That's why we find in Ezekiel, God says this, Moreover, I, gave, I also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. So if we would have sanctification through God, it says here that it's through the Sabbath that he sanctifies because the same power that he used to create is the same power that he uses to sanctify his people. This is why the angel says this, as we saw before, it says, Fear God and worship him. Because God is calling the whole world back to worshipping him. Because the issue, as we found in the last days, is over worship. It's either enforced worship and deception, or it's true worship. This is why today we're looking at this next text. We looked at that text and we saw the link between the literal and the spiritual. We looked at, at literal Babylon and we saw the sort of worship that went on there. And we've seen what's going on today with this symbol and how Satan is using it to bring in false worship. And we've seen also that there is a last day group, the 144,000, who will not bow down and worship the gods of Babylon. So today we've exposed these gods of Babylon. We've seen their origins. We've seen the infiltration into the churches of this, of this satanic symbol that Satan is using through the worship of the sun god and through the day on which the sun god is worshipped to bring in false worship. And that's why God warns us finally in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4. It says here, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. It's a very, very interesting text. The question today that we've looked at is the Trinity. And as we've seen, that if the Trinity is the false, then what does the Bible reveal about the true, about the worship of the true God? What does the Bible show us about the worship of the one true God? And this is what we need to do, is to search to search the scriptures diligently, daily, to see if we can find, or to, to find the truth that is revealed in the Bible that shows the worship of the one true God. God has brought this message to each one of you today out of his everlasting love. He has an everlasting love for each one and he does not want anybody to perish but to worship him only. And he's calling the whole world back to worship him 
the only true God through his only begotten son Jesus Christ the decision that you have to make today is which one will you serve which God will you serve the decision is yours let's close in a word of prayer loving father in heaven we come again before you in Jesus' precious name and we thank you and we praise you and we worship you, Father, for all that you have done for us. We thank you for your word of truth. We thank you that you have shown us, Father, clearly today the deception that is being forced upon the people of this world. How Satan is using these symbols and, and this day and the sun worship in all the different religions of this world to deceive the whole world as you've said in your word and to bring worship about of himself through the beast power we can see this father happening daily we can see the the, the strength of the papacy growing and growing we can see the whole world wandering after the beast but father we need your help we want by your grace, we need by your grace to be part of the 144,000, be part of that group that will stand in the last days and who will not bow down to the gods of Babylon, but who will worship the one true God, you, Holy Father, the God of heaven and earth, the creator of the heavens and the earth and the seas and the fountains of waters and all that in them is, and to worship you on your true Sabbath day we thank you, Father, that you've brought these things to view. We pray that you would guide and bless us and help us to stand firm and strong. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.